Hey there, I'm Joey Santos, the online pastor here at Christ Church. Welcome to CC Life Plus. Thank you so much for checking us out. Listen, you probably saw a lot of content here, right? For kids, adults, uh, music, podcasts. That's why we created this for you. So listen, go ahead, fill out this form right here because we created this with you in mind so we can connect. It's all about engagement. So we want to talk with you. We want to engage with you. We want to discover about new ways that we can grow together in Christ through technology.
build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Wait, well, good morning, Church of the Bar. Brad Wilson here, good to be with you, and uh, we're kind of moving on this road trip together. Last week we talked about Paul and Timothy and where, where Paul found himself in jail in Rome. And so uh, today we're, we're going to go back into the Old Testament. We're going to go back to Genesis, um, first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 32, and we're going to talk uh, about a guy named Jacob. And uh, the, the place we're going to go uh, on the trip with Jacob uh, is a place in, in the Bible known as Peniel. And what's significant about this place is, uh, as we're going to read in a few moments, this is a, a place where, where, where Jacob runs into an unexpected guest, an unexpected visitor. And it, it got me thinking a little bit going through this uh, about how uh, sometimes uh, we go on a road trip, we're traveling someplace, maybe it's vacation, maybe it's a reunion, um, wherever it's going, sometimes on a road trip, uh, we get those unexpected guests, those unexpected visitors. Have you ever been someplace on, on vacation, on a trip, and uh, you had a, an unwelcomed guest in the form of, of some type of, of, of animal or you know reptile or something like that? Maybe you're someplace and a, a snake gets into your cabin or the place you're staying. Um, I remember going down to, years ago I was in college, going down... Uh, with the family to Gatlinburg and driving in there and, and I remember we got there at night and uh, brother-in-law takes a pita throws it outside and just kind of oh you know we're, we're somewhere of oh, something we'll eat this up and we'll be good with it and I remember we're down here and a couple days go by and we're getting ready to head back and all of a sudden we hear this ruckus and outside um, my sister-in-law is on top of her SUV, and there's a bear that's out there. The bear had found the pita. Uh, the mama bear was there and had two cubs. And so uh, my sister-in-law is up on top of her SUV, and this bear's kind of going around, and people are panicked. Her husband's trying to distract the bear so she can, she can get inside. And, and long story short, um, there's enough distraction because the mama bear is worried about these cubs that she finally moves away from the SUV, everyone runs inside, we close the door. And we look back on that trip and think, man, stuff, that unexpected guest, that unexpected visitor could have completely changed that trip. Fortunately, everyone was safe, the bears were good, uh, the family was good. But it's interesting sometimes how you go someplace and what happens or who you run into or the unexpected things that pop up can often surprise us. And so as we're going to talk about this today with Jacob and this visitor, this guest he runs into on our road trip into the Old Testament this morning, uh, I want to jump in with a, a question right away that, that kind of brings us back to what we are, are talking about right now, what I led into, and that is, have you ever had an unexpected guest join you on a vacation? Just you're traveling somewhere, you're going to road trip, you're going to vacation, maybe you're going to, to see some family and have you ever experienced where an unexpected guest, maybe, it, like I said, maybe it was an animal, maybe it was a family member you didn't think was going to be there, and you made plans to go there thinking this family member wasn't going to be there and they showed up, or maybe it was someone completely random that kind of crashed your vacation. But have you ever experienced or had an unexpected guest join you on vacation? That's our first question. So take a few minutes to jump into this question, and uh, then we'll be back and, and we'll get moving today.
All right, welcome back. And I'm sure there are some fascinating stories of, of the unexpected on, the, on these vacations. And so let's jump into Genesis chapter 32 today. And we're going to begin here in verse 30. Then we're going to kind of work our way backwards. Because uh, as I said, Jacob in our road trip's taken us to this place called Peniel. And verse 30 says, Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. So kind of a, a little bit of a, a spoiler right there. The unexpected guest that Jacob is going to run into that he encounters is God. Now, it's not, you know, God the God being, but he runs into, as the Bible says, we'll find out later, there's a, a man, uh, an angel. And often we see in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord or, or God, his presence is manifested uh, in an angel or another being. And he's veiled. So as he says here, I saw God face to face, yet my life was spared. And, and so when we see this happen in the Old Testament, you think about Moses. When Moses um, was, was getting the Ten Commandments, and the Bible talks about how God hid Moses in a rock and passed by, and Moses saw the back of his garment, and how his face was changed. Like, when you would see God, like, if, if, if Jacob would have saw God in the full, not veiled, he, he, wouldn't have, he wouldn't have lived. He would have died. But because God manifests himself, he's in this man and is his, is his angel, he's there, He's able, to, he's able to encounter him, and he says life's able to be spared. And at Peniel, the, the thing with this story is this is where Jacob wrestles with God. And what we're going to see today is that Jacob needed to square off with God. He needed to wrestle with God. He needed to work things out with God in order for him to continue on the journey that God wanted him to, him to continue on. This event was going to change his life. And so today, we're going to talk about why... This was important for Jacob, but why for us today, there is something significant about those moments in our life where we step into the ring with God, where we wrestle with God, where we work things out with God. And so let's go back to Genesis chapter 32. Let's jump into verse 22. It says, that night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. So Jacob's camped out here. He sends his wives, his children, his possessions uh, across the fort of the Jabbok. And so then he's alone, and, and while he's alone, uh, he encounters this man. He encounters God, and they wrestle till daybreak. Now, you may be asking, why was Jacob doing these things? Jacob is preparing to meet his brother Esau. And Jacob and Esau had a history. They were, they were brothers, but they, they weren't on the same page. They weren't very friendly. And Jacob right now is, is operating out of a lot of fear that Esau is going to kill him. In fact, Esau, that, that's, that's his stated goal of his earlier in Genesis because Jacob steals Esau's birthright. So there's tension. There's this crazy family dynamic. And Jacob knows that Esau and 400 men are coming towards him. So Jacob is trying to figure out a plan to save his wives, to save his children, to, to save as, as much of what he has as possible. And so in the night, he's working these things out. He's sending people across. He's trying to protect everyone. And while this is taking place, after he sends them across, he goes one-on-one -on -one with God. Now, for some of us, this idea of wrestling with God may be a difficult concept to grasp. Because we think if I'm wrestling with God, if I'm fighting with God, if I'm battling God over something, that means I don't have faith, or that means I, I don't trust, or that means I, I, I have a bad view of God, and, and I don't want us to think of it that way today. See, I think there's, there's things with all of us that we need to work out with God. And, and the thing about God that I know is that God can handle your questions, God can handle your doubts, God can handle the, 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 the problems, the struggles you have. In fact, he wants us to give him those things. He wants the opportunity to speak truth into our lives and to help mold us and form us into who he wants us to be. And often, a big part of that process is you and me kind of working these things out with God. And sometimes it comes from us wrestling with God. And so today we're going to talk about there's three things that happen, I believe, when we wrestle with God. And I believe that wrestling with God 
sometimes is necessary for you and me because it creates these opportunities that we're going to talk about today in our relationship with God. And the first opportunity is this. It creates the opportunity when we wrestle with God to turn our fears over to God. Let's go into Genesis, back into Genesis chapter 32, and we're going to go all the way back to verse 7. Verse 7 says that in great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups. And the flocks and the herds and camels as well. And so he's fearful. And, and why is he fearful? He's fearful because of Esau. Verse 9 says, Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But, God, you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. So Jacob here is, he, he's controlled and he's consumed with fear. He's afraid of his brother Esau. He's afraid of being attacked by Esau. He was afraid of losing his wives. He was afraid of losing his children. He was afraid of losing everything he had. And he was afraid that the promise made to him from God may not be fulfilled. See, fear was consuming his life and it was influencing his decisions. And like Jacob, when fear is present in our lives and controlling our lives, it can be very destructive, it can be very harmful, it can be very disruptive in your life and my life. And fear can be extremely isolating if not dealt with. You see, some of us wrestle with the fear of rejection. Some of us are afraid that if our spouse or our children or our best friend found out about a decision we made in the past, that they wouldn't want anything to do with us because of that decision we made. And so instead of, of talking about this, we do everything we can to avoid it. And so that fear of rejection causes us to, to avoid dealing with certain things. Some of us struggle with the fear of failure. It may not be a, a constant thing, but we're afraid of failing. You're stuck today. You're, you're, you're in neutral. But that fear, the fear of failure is keeping you from experiencing life. Right? Some of us, you're, 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 you're divorced. You're going through a divorce. You've been divorced, and, and, and you're afraid of that next relationship because you don't want your marriage to fail again. And so you don't pursue relationships outside your, your friends uh, your close friends or your family because you don't want to go through the pain. You don't want to, to, to feel like you fail again. Maybe you're at work and you didn't get that job or the promotion. So you're not applying for that next opportunity that everyone says you'd be good at because you don't want to experience failing again. So it keeps you where you're at. Some of us are, 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 are controlled. We're, we're afraid of, we got the fear of approval. Right? Like, we so desperately want to be liked. We so desperately want people um, to, to approve who we are and what we do that we compromise our beliefs, we compromise our convictions just to get the affirmation or, uh, or the approval we so desperately crave from people. And even though it's coming from a bad place, we think, well, approval from a bad place is better than no approval at all. Some of us were we're wrestling with the fear of sin. You're trapped right now in sin, and, and you're making decisions that you know you shouldn't make. You're making decisions you don't really want to make, but you can't get out of it. And you're afraid that you can't talk to God about it because God will judge you. You can't talk to uh, a friend about it because they'll judge you. And so this fear of sin, of, of, of people finding out your sin, of people uh, not wanting to be with you, people not wanting to be around you, it's, it's isolating you. And there's, there's so many other fears we can get into. But at some point, man, what we see in the Bible is we've got to turn those fears over to God. I love what the prophet Isaiah says in, in chapter 12, verse 4, talking about this match. He says, yes, he, Jacob, wrestled with the angel who's God and won. He wept and pleaded for a blessing from him. And what that tells us is during this match, it was not just physical it was emotional. 
it was it was spiritual that all these things all these fears inside jacob were coming out in this moment while they were engaged while they were locked up while they were wrestling there was an intensity in jacob because he was giving everything to god so brings us to our second question today it made sense and it was helpful that jacob gave everything over to god we should probably do the same especially our fears and so here's our question number two why is it important to turn your fears over to god take a few minutes talk about that then we'll be back to continue on
All right, Church of the Bar, welcome back. Let's keep moving. The, the first thing we talked about that it's, it's necessary to wrestle with God at times because it gives us the opportunity to turn our fears over to God. Here's the second thing this morning. It engages us with God. Go back to verse 26. It says, then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. He's asking Jacob to let him go and, and Jacob won't. They're engaged. They're locked up. And it is, this battle, as we said a little bit ago, was, was a, a battle. Not just it was a physical battle, but it was an emotional battle. And Tony Ranke wrote this book, 12 Ways Your Phone is Changing You. And in this book, he, he says quietly, you know, you know, secretly, without us even really knowing, he says our phones are changing us. And he catalogs uh, the quiet catastrophe he believes our phones are causing. For instance, he says we're distracted, that, that we on average, check our smartphones 85,000 times a year or once every 4.3 minutes. So that we're not just distracted, we're a hazard to others. Texting and driving make us 23 times more likely to get into a car accident. We, we crave approval. We just talked about it a few moments ago that, that each social media moment is another scene in our incessant autobiography, and we want people to approve that autobiography. Talks about because of our phones and, and the, 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 the addiction to them, we idolize celebrity. Our attention often drifts from the eternal toward the latest headlines and gossip. Says we become lonely, that technology is drawing us apart by design. We feel the sting of loneliness in the middle of online connectedness. He talks about how we get lost in the digital noise, that the average daily social media and email output is larger than the Library of Congress. And the last thing he says is that we just lose track of time. The wonder of people, of plants, and nature, and relationships, and, and the wonder of even God himself gets lost in the whirlwind of urgent notifications. And so the part and the point of this book is that our phones made it harder for us to engage with God, to engage with each other, because we're constantly drawn into this thing. And all of us find ourselves at certain moments, certain times in our lives where God feels extremely distant. Like God is, is you and God are so far apart, yet we know that the, the Bible teaches us that God wants to be in relationship with us. He wants to be engaged with us. And sometimes, as crazy as it sounds, wrestling with God brings us into that engagement with God. It connects us back to God. And you think, that's crazy. But it's not really crazy. See, Jacob right here in this moment, as he's wrestling with God, he's not letting go. He's not letting go of God. He's engaged with God. And as we're going to see in a little bit that, 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 that he ends up being wounded, but he's asking for a blessing because he doesn't want to leave that moment without God blessing him, without God making sure to, to reaffirm to him that the plan is still in place. And some of us today, we need to get in that ring with God, so to speak. We need to engage with God, and we need to make sure that we don't leave that match. We don't stop wrestling with God. We don't let God go until we get ourselves to that place, until we're, we're confident that God's plan for us is still the same, that God is still there, that God is still working in the lives, that God still wants to work in your lives. Wrestling with God re-engages us with God. It brings us back to God. It's important. And that brings us to our third question. See, I don't know for you, but for me, often when life seems to be easy, when life seems to be going well, I don't do it intentionally, but if I'm not careful, I can create distance from God. It's like when life's difficult, boom, I, I, I'm, I'm seeking God out. But sometimes when life's good, at least to me, I'm like, life is good, it, it's easy to become disconnected with God. So the question for, for you all to think about right now is why is it easy for us to be disconnected from God when life is good? Take a few minutes, talk about this, and then we'll be back. We got one more question, and then we're going to wrap things up today.
All right, welcome back, and let's keep moving. Right, we've talked about wrestling with God. It engages us with God. It, it allows us to turn our fears over to God. And here's the last thing, and this might be the most important one. Wrestling with God changes us because of God. Let's go back to chapter 32. Verse 25 said that when the man saw he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Right, so they were, they were there. Now, God could have completely destroyed Jacob, but he's wrestling with him, and he's realizing Jacob's not letting go. He's not leaving this. He's going to continue to battle. So he touched his hip, and his hip goes out of socket, it's wrenched. Verse 27 says, the man asked him, what is your name? Because he's not letting go. Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. So that's the first thing. Continues on. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. And when we see this, Jacob goes into this match with God. No hip issues. And, and he goes into it as, as, as one man, as the, as the man he is. But he leaves there with a limp, but he's changed. And see, sometimes the, 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 the most important reason why we wrestle with God is we leave those matches, we leave those moments changed for the better. See, Jacob, as he moved forward from this struggle, he, he was going to be different. And I, I like what I read this week. Someone said that the divine touch can wound and heal at the same time. The divine touch can wound and heal at the same time. Jacob leaves this experience, this engagement with God, wounded, but he's been healed. He's been changed. He leaves it. He's no longer Jacob, but, but God says, you're Israel because you've struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. See, up until this point, Jacob was known more for his deceiving, for his deception, for his manipulation than anything. He stole and manipulated his father to get Esau's birthright, because Esau was the oldest. Jacob, the name meant heel grabber. Jacob was a deceiver. He tricked things. He manipulated his father-in-law to increase his own flocks. And so Jacob... Was, was about planning, he was about scheming, he was about doing things in his way, in his mind, and he left this moment wounded, and God said, you're going to be different. And he was different. He worried about the promise not being there, and God kept the promise. But when he left it, he left with a limp. He left with a wound. And you may say, well, well, well what's the significance of the wound? Why, why would that happen sometimes? See, sometimes I think when we are engaged with God, we may leave that engagement with a wound, and not because God is mean, but because God wants us to be reminded that He is the one that controls our futures, that He is the one that has the plans for us, that He is the one who is going to work through our lives, that He is the one that should get the glory, that He is the one that deserves the credit, that He is the one that we need to lean into under all circumstances, all situations, at all times, for his wisdom, for his guidance, for his direction. And so every time Jacob would move forward, every time Jacob would walk, he'd be reminded of this encounter with God and how it changed him and how God spared him and how God was still going to use him for what he was going to do. See, Jacob was blessed by God in this moment. And Jacob would, be, would continue to be the one that God would build his people through. And that all happened during this trip, during this moment in Peniel. And so for some of us today, it's time for you and me to take a trip to Peniel. For some of us today, we need to go there and we need to kind of square off with God. We need to go there and be like, God, there's some stuff we need to talk about. There is something we need to work through. There's something that I, I need to turn over to you. God, I, I, I need to leave this moment with you different. I leave this moment with you changed. So this is, brings us to our last question today. And what it, it's this. What is keeping you from getting in to the ring with God? Right? Because we know at times we need to engage with God. But sometimes we avoid that. So what is it? What's keeping you from getting in the ring with God? Take a few moments, talk about that, and then we'll be back to wrap things up today.
All right, Church of the Bar, what a, uh, I've had a great time with you today. Obviously, I'm coming through a camera, but it, it's, been, it's been good. I'm, I'm excited about this, and I'm hoping that if, if you're hearing this today and you know, I need to get in the ring with God. I need to wrestle with God. I need to work some things out with God. Just do it. Don't, don't delay. Don't waste, those, don't waste time with it. See, some of us, it is time for us to get into the ring with God. For some of us, it may not be the, the, the R word isn't ring, it's relationship. For some of us, it's time to get into a relationship with God. And I want to encourage you today that whether you need to re-engage with God or whether you need to engage with God for the first time, that you'll have the, the boldness that just like Jacob, when he saw this man, when he saw this angel, when he saw this unexpected guest, this unexpected visitor, and he engaged with him, he wrestled with him. Man, let's take a page out of Jacob's book, and let's make sure that we're, we're taking that step, that, that we're re-engaging with God, or we're engaging with God because we know that's what we need to do. We know that's what's required for us to take that next step on our journey. Let me pray for you, and then we're going to turn things back over uh, to your leaders at Church of the Bar, and uh, let you guys continue on with your Sunday morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for just the example of Jacob, and we thank you for um, just a reminder today that there are times in life where instead of avoiding you, we need to engage with you. And Father, sometimes it may not be easy. Uh, Father, sometimes it, it may be painful. Um, it may be emotional. But Father, we know that when we encounter you, when we engage with you, that we leave those moments, we leave those times with you changed and better. Father, give us the courage to, uh, to step into the ring with you if we need to do that today. Father, give us the courage to step into a relationship with you if that's what's needed as well. We thank you for how you love us. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.